sold out today at 125 RSVPs. And uh, we are doing, we are back to two webinars a month. Our next webinar coming up is on Thursday the 28th. And uh, by popular demand, we're actually bringing back Mark Ainley, who's our, our resident, I shouldn't say resident, because he's not just local, he's an internationally renowned uh, feng shui master, and the topic is going to be catered. We've been working with him to cater a topic for just us and our group that we're inviting for inner and outer health. He's aware of today's event, and he's going to be piggybacking off of some of the things that we talk about. So if you um, haven't had a chance to see Mark Ainley speak, I highly recommend you keep your eyes open for that one. He's a fantastic speaker. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. We will be um, uh, allowing you to ask any questions you want, just type them in to the chat box and we'll get to all the questions at the end of today's event. It is a CEU certified event today. Many of you have already typed in your the code that we need to give you the credit for that. If you do not have, or you forgot to put that code in, please email Tracy Khan at Technion and she's managing to make sure everyone gets their registration credits. Um, You'll find a list of our upcoming events beyond just uh, this next one in January on our website at cheeseoffice.ca under the events. Today's show will be recorded, um, although we won't be sending out the actual presentation. We frequently get um, uh, that question, can we send out the PowerPoint itself? We don't send out uh, the PowerPoints, especially for, for CEU, CEUs, we can't send those out. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go into a brief introduction of our speaker, Laura Lee from Calgary. Laura Lee is a workplace specialist and a and market manager for Technion Calgary, where she is responsible for the development of key business relationships, as well as sales and marketing strategies for architecture and interior design firms in Southern Alberta. Throughout her career, Laura Lee has had a passion of teaching and imparting knowledge. She's regularly called upon by clients and industry professionals to provide research and trends impacting workplace and the practice of commercial interior design. She has had many speaking engagements and regularly provides product knowledge and continuing education sessions on a variety of topics to the architectural and interior design community. Laura Lee has participated in the development and organization of key industry events, has served as a board member for the Cornet Calgary, and has been a strong proponent of sustainability through her work as a Living Building Challenge Ambassador and as a LEED certified accredited professional. Most recently, she's become well accredited, congratulations, and subsequently, a well faculty member. Joining the movement to advance the health and well being in buildings and communities, Laura Lee continues to promote the value of good design, its influences, and business and society as, it, as its power to create a positive change. Today's webinar is called Lick the Frog. I'm sure there's a lot of questions and, and anticipation to understand exactly what that's going to be about. I will pass it over to Laura Lee. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nolan. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to come and uh, do this CEU with you today. It's one that I actually developed and wrote myself. Um, so I'm very proud of it. And it's always an, a, a fun one for me to, to do. I'm just going to pull up my, um, my screen and just make sure that you can all see uh, the screen there. Uh, just a thumbs up. Perfect. Um, so uh, before we got started, uh, Nolan was saying, well, I think Lick the Frog is kind of an interesting um, title for a presentation. And uh, the, the payoff at the end is you get to, to find out sort of where that, um, that title came from. So I don't like to give it away too soon, but I uh, uh, hope you'll have a better understanding of that as we go through the presentation today. So over the next hour or so, we're gonna discuss creative thinking. Not to be confused with artistic creativity, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. But we wanna, I really wanna talk about why it's such an important skill uh, and valuable skill right now. We're gonna review what science says is going on in our brains when we're thinking creatively. And I'm gonna share with you some examples of effective implementation of some outside the box thinking. I'm hoping we'll get a chance to uh, stretch our brains a bit and try uh, a creative thinking technique for ourselves, but I, I will certainly give you lots of um, great techniques that you can, that you can utilize beyond um, uh, today's session. Uh, and, you know, going through those exercises might feel really natural to some of you, but for others, it might feel a bit awkward and messy. And the good news is that um, creative thinking is something that anyone can tap into. Uh, at, 
for any aspect of our, our work and personal lives. And it's something that you can learn and hone and develop just like any other skill that you have. So hopefully by the end of today's session, I will uh, give you some techniques that you can use to help sharpen your own creative thinking skills and add to your personal uh, toolkit. So we'll get started right away with uh, why is creative thinking so important right now? And uh, I'm pretty sure all of you can actually finish this statement uh, quite easily. Great minds think alike. And if we're all thinking alike, is it possible that we may all actually land on the same solutions often as well? If you think about, um, so many of us will have gone through a very similar uh, educational system, uh, maybe even gone to the same school, maybe even uh, the same classes. Uh, um, and the design community and architectural community can be quite close. Uh, often we surround ourselves with like-minded individuals um, uh, quite frequently. Even today's algorithms really do kind of lead us down a very common path of uh, finding out what we like and kind of sticking to it. So in a world where everybody has opportunity to kind of possess the same information, how can we possibly differentiate ourselves these days? And well, the answer is really by thinking differently and generating different ideas than everyone else with the information that we all really do kind of access to. So we need to come up with different solutions, uh, often in, in our world, different solutions than our competitors. There was a, a survey done of about uh, 1,500 CEOs. Um, IBM did the survey, uh, 60 different countries, 33 different industry types. And what uh, they heard from these CEOs is that more than ever before, uh, the, the ability to really navigate this increasingly complex world is going to require creativity. Unfortunately, that same uh, group of uh, CEOs, less than half of them said that their organizations were equipped to um, push innovation forward through creativity and creative thinking. More than, uh, more than half were really felt that their organizations didn't cultivate uh, creativity within its current parameters. So there is a recognition there that things need to change. So I love uh, Edward de Bono. If um, he's a, a guru in the world of creative thinking, there's all kinds of YouTube videos uh, about him or uh, he's written several books. The Creativity Workout is one of them. But he talks about um, information as commodity nowadays. Uh, there's nothing stopping everybody from having access to information, but creativity is one of the ways we can really uh, push ourselves forward, especially in this ever-changing world. We can't possibly imagine uh, what's coming next, especially, I mean, if the last year has demonstrated that quite well. But what we really do need to equip ourselves with is the ability to adapt. Uh, we need to adopt this reality of constant change um, and progress and able to stay competitive and sex successful. So that means moving outside our current processes and our comfort zones often um, and creating this competitive edge or creative edge is what he talks about. So creative thinking is, it, it really is quickly becoming one of the most sought after skills today. Uh, and you'll see that if, uh, speaking with HR professionals, I follow that industry a fair bit. And that is definitely um, something that uh, is being sought after as a uh, highly valued skill and, demonst and um, asking applicants to demonstrate ways in which they've been creative in the past. So right now I'm actually gonna ask you to um, kind of uh, use your imagination a little bit right now. And I'm gonna ask you to imagine yourself going on a hike. And actually to help you all out, uh, cause you're in the Vancouver market, I I've picked an example of a hike that many of you may know, which is um, a spot around Vancouver, which is Quarry Rock at Deep Cove. Um, lots of people like to go there. It's beautifully um, scenic and, and uh, offers you a, a great view uh, and vista. Now, the, it's a nice payoff for some physical exertion, um, but as you can see, the path is pretty worn and it is, um, you know, got a, a very distinct route. And when we think about um, sort of hiking or taking a well-worn route, I, I would say that thinking is really very much like going on a hike. Um, it is, our, our brains really do like, oops, 
why don't I go back one? Sorry, our brains really do. Um, oh, for some reason, my sorry. There we go. I'm going to go back to this um, this slide because it really does demonstrate sort of those well worn um, paths, right? Our brains similarly choose to take the the most developed neural pathways when we're thinking. Um, the path this path represents our brains when we're thinking over a problem. We're wired to take the path of least resistance and follow the paths we already wrote. No, and and don't get me wrong, um, that is really fine. A lot of the times, following a well-worn path and doing uh, things the way we always do is important. We create processes, procedures, methods um, that are predictable and repeatable. And for evolution, that has been uh, an important part of of um, humanity. So, but this climb takes you to. Um, you know, a particular view or a particular destination. It's a well-worn path, it's a cut trail. But we know, um, what we know about cut trails is often uh, many people have the same idea and end up in the same place as you. So what if I asked you to think about this hike as maybe a client experience um, with you? Trying to solve a problem the usual way gives us the usual answers, right? And what if, um, you know, we, we all have a process that works for us and uh, a shorthand or, you know, our experiences, we have been in an, an industry for a long time, kind of becomes our map. Um, but what if all our competitors have the same map and they're taking everybody on the same hike too? What if you really wanted to push yourself um, or get to a different place on the mountain or get a different perspective or view? What if we wanted to push ourselves or, or our clients? Well, we'd have to cut a new trail. And I don't know how many of you have ever cut a new trail before if you're avid, an avid hiker, but it's hard work. You move forward, um, you come against an obstacle, you might have to backtrack sometimes, you shift directions and you move on. But there is definitely an investment in the journey. It can be messy, um, but you're moving towards something new and exciting. So, oops. Um, to generate an, a new idea, we kind of actually need to create a new neural pathway in our brain, much like cutting a new um, a, a new hiking trail. So if our goal is to carve new neural pathways and fire up new synapses, we need to get a bit uncomfortable. We need to challenge ourselves and we need to invest in the journey, much like we would if we were cutting a brand new hiking trail. Unfortunately, a little bit of the problem with that is that um, our brains like to take the path of least resistance. We really do rely on our past experiences um, and established connections within our brains to, um, to shape how we move forward or how we encounter or respond to uh, situations we're put into. We, um, we really rely on, on um, feeling uh, safe and feeling like we know where we're moving forward. And we don't often really want to put ourselves in those positions of being frustrated or confused. But one of the things that we do know and uh, science, and I'll, I'll explain as we move forward, is that if you're feeling frustrated, um, you may be in the company of some of the greatest poets and composers and inventors of all time. And more, more than likely, you're, you're on the verge of uh, going somewhere new and unchartered, which is uh, what creative thinking is all about. So I, um, I can't see any of you. Uh, oh, there's a couple of you. But um, I, if I were doing this in the before times, uh, I do actually ask for a show of hounds of how many people would say that they're creative. Now, I hope that many of you in this group who would say that we're in a, a creative field, but for many people, um, they often doubt or misjudge their own creative skills. And the truth I'm happy to share is that, again, anybody and everybody is creative. In fact, we're all extremely creative. It's just knowing how to tap into those um, uh, those skills. So I said earlier, uh, I didn't want us to confuse creative thinking with uh, creative artist artistry. And but we often do associate creativity with the art specifically. So painting, sculpture, dance, um, music, poetry, even architecture and interior design. But if you think about it, the single mother that stretches her budget for a month, is pretty creative. Uh, the engineer that just figures out how to distribute a heavy load in a new way, that's creative. 
certainly a uh, mild-mannered accountant who bilks his organization out of millions of dollars, extremely creative. Um, Alice Flaherty, who is one of the foremost uh, researchers, neuroscientists, um, researching creativity at Harvard, boils it down to this. A creative idea will simply do, be defined as one that is both novel and useful or influential in a particular social setting. Really, creativity applies to absolutely every field, programming, business, mathematics, uh, together with the more creative fields. But it allows managers, analysts, um, other industry professionals really to um, look at things from a different perspective and produce solutions that will separate them in the market. Now, I, um, I, I should have mentioned to everybody, if you have a, a pencil or a pen or a piece of paper handy, it would be really great uh, if you could grab that because I'd like us to try a little exercise. So um, I'm just gonna pop open. I've got a piece of paper there. I'm gonna ask you to do something that many of you may have encountered before, but uh, my experience has, uh, has led me to believe that many people forget, even though they've encountered this uh, once or twice before in their, um, uh, in their time. If you just simply put nine dots on a, your piece of paper in front of you, and I'd like you to try and link all nine dots with a straight line, uh, only four straight lines. They need to cross through all nine dots, but please, but don't lift your pencil. So I'll give you a minute or two to do this. And like I said, I, I know I had encountered this myself before. And when I, um, when I encountered it again, when I was doing uh, this exercise or, or creating the CEU, uh, I totally um, bombed remembering how to do this. And uh, I, I'm, as we move forward, I'm gonna explain to you that tons of kindergartners in seconds, no problem for them. But most of you, I'm gonna say, um, are probably gonna go from one corner to the other, then down the side, back across and diagonally, up only to realize how many of you got one dot left? Probably quite a few. And I'm gonna say, um, that you may have imposed some rules upon this exercise that I didn't uh, vocalize. And I'm gonna guess that there was maybe some math teacher back in grade seven or in uh, grade school who said, you always have to stop in the dot. And that's because um, again, we, how we think of things is based not just on what we see or perceive visually in here, but all of that information that we have in our past experiences help us shape our, um, our solutions. So what you would have wanted to do was go past the dot uh, and further and create angles that would allow you to solve this uh, problem. Again, the images that strike our retina do not themselves tell us with certainty <laughs> what we're seeing. Um, visual perception is largely a result of all that statistical expectations um, uh, that we have and the brain has a way of, ex of filling in all the blanks based on uh, our past uh, experience. It really does, those experiences modify the neural um, connections so they become more efficient they create those well-worn hiking path. That's your traveled, your well-traveled path. Because again, our brains are looking to be as efficient as possible. Um, so everything we encounter and absorb or um, are surrounded by now is a product of our complete uh, brain, everything that's happened to us in the past. So I go back to that um, seventh grade teacher that told you to stop in the, in the dot, your brain drew on that and blocked you in. So I've freed you of that uh, rule now. So I'm wondering how many of you could actually solve this with three lines? Do you think it's possible? Just give you a second to, to give that a try. You just need to sweep outside the box a bit further.
And if you choose your angles well, you don't even have to go through the middle of the dots. You just have to touch the very slightest bit. Now, um, if I told you it was possible to solve this with one dot, with one line, do you think you can do it? I'll give you an example. Um, again, so one of the things about our neural pathways for sure is that the first time we encounter a problem, uh, tons of our entire network of neurons um, kind of perceive that stimuli and start firing and try and figure out how things are done. But by the sixth time we encounter something of similar nature or something we perceive to be um, consistent with the first experience, only a subset of neurons actually fire. It's uh, alarmingly uh, um, less than the first encounter. So I've given you some time to think about this idea about how you could solve it with one line. And I say kindergartner solve it in a flash because nobody told them how thick the line needed to be. If I asked you to draw me a sunset, I would get something pretty quick from all of you and it would be relatively the same. And I, I know this to be true and Tracy can back me up because we do a, another workshop called the discovery dilemma and everybody's sunset is absolutely the same. 98% of the time. But if I asked you ima to imagine a sunset on Pluto, the possibilities for creative thinking become much greater because um, I'm assuming none of you have been there uh, unless you've had some like trippy times, but um, that, that would free you up to do so much more um, and create so much more in that, um, in that drawing because we're pushing past anything you've experienced before. So there is a need for past experience. I mentioned that earlier, it helps us navigate the world. It's necessary part of human evolution, absolutely has been. And we need both critical and creative thinking. We're, we'll focus most on the creative thinking today, but it is important to understand what the critical portion of, of the thinking is too. It's critical thinking is how we assess worth or validity of something that already exists, right? It's um, the logical sequential discipline process of rationalizing, analyzing, evaluating, and interpreting, interpreting information to make informed judgments and or decisions. But creative thinking tries to create something new. It's a new way of looking at problems or situations with a fresh perspective to conceive of something that's new or original. We talk about critical thinking often as divergent think or uh, convergent thinking, sorry, narrowing down the answer. And what do we know? I mean, all of us would have gone through a fairly similar education background and, you know, we're trained to give the right answer and we're punished when we give the wrong one. Um, and, and that's just kind of a, a part of our, our education system. We're, creative thinking is all about opening up. It's divergent. It's an answer. But the most common response to a new idea that isn't fully formed or fleshed out is criticism, which often stops us from exploring these uh, possibilities any future because we know we learned early when we put up our hand and we give the wrong answer, no. It's, uh, you know, either we're criticized or chastised for that. And what happens as we um, move further in, on, in, in the world, that critic actually becomes quite internal and we dismiss fleeting thoughts and ideas um, because they aren't fully fleshed out. We don't give them that opportunity um, and they're quashed before they even have a chance. Now, I'm guessing that some of you may have been told or I even said it yourself before that uh, you're either a right-brained or a left-brained person, right? That theory is based on some research that happened in the 60s by Nobel Prize winner Roger W. Sperry. Um, the left brain, and, and he did uh, he did lots of research and that's what got him his Nobel Prize. Um, the left brain is definitely more verbal, analytical, orderly um, than the right brain. And we sometimes call that the digital brain. It's better at things like reading, writing, computations. It's associated with logic, sequencing, linear thinking, mathematics, facts, and thinking words. So if you think back to the last slide we just showed, much more on that critical thinking side of the page. The right brain is more visual, um, intuitive. Sometimes this is known as the analog brain. And it's creative uh, or associated with creative and less organized methods of thinking uh, associated with imagination, holistic thinking, intuition, 
art, rhythm, nonverbal cues, um, feelings, visualization, daydreaming. So, you know, so I think a lot of times we label uh, people into one of those two categories. But a team of neuroscientists um, not too long ago actually um, set out to test this premise. And after two years of exhaustive analysis, they actually determined that there is no proof to this theory of being a left or a right brain person or thinker. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just not correct. They did a ton of magnetic resonance imaging of um, a huge subset of individuals and they revealed that the human brain doesn't actually favor one side or the other. Um, the networks on one side aren't generally stronger than the networks on, on the other side. They just happen to um, function differently. I like to think of it as, uh, you know, one side's a Mac and one's, one's Windows. They're, they're different operating systems, but they are inextric inextricably linked together. The human brain, it's a very intricate organ and um, we only know of minute amount of information about it. Uh, but some of the things we do know, it is filled with about 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion uh, connections. Your brain is command central of everything you think, feel, and do. So again, those two hemispheres are tied together and they've shown this, um, both sides light up uh, um, when doing both types of, of thinking, critical or creative thinking. And the two sides, as they function differently, um, they do work together to complement one another. Um, and you don't use one side uh, just in, uh, alone on its own. Uh, they work in concert for sure. So when you're trying to solve any type of problem, whether it be uh, creative or logical, uh, both sides are giving you information. So your left brain is engaged to, to understand things like language, but the right brain is engaged to understand the context and the tone of that language. So um, again, your left brain might handle mathematical computations, but your right brain understands um, rough estimates and comparisons. So as I said, they're inextricably connected. Now, it's been hard for a number of years to really understand what's happening in our brains when we're thinking creatively because it's uh, not exactly easy to just, you know, put somebody on the spot and say, oh, be creative. But researchers have been um, actually uh, in recent years um, studying freestyle rappers, which have helped them uh, determine all kinds of information about what's going on when, when we are doing on the spot um, creative thinking. And what they have determined, there are three very distinct areas in our brain that are working uh, during these processes. And the one is the attentional control network, which is all the green bits, the imagination network, which is all the red stuff, and then the um, flexibility network, attentional flexibility network, which is the yellow bit. And so those each represent something. The, the attentional control network, that's our laser focus. That's when we are concentrating on something. Our network is really active when we're challenging ourselves, listening to a lecture or engaging in a complex sol uh, problem solving reasoning. It puts really heavy demand on our working memory. So if I were to hook you up to a IMRI, <laughs> um, magnetic resonating image right now, I would, uh, I would hopefully see some of your little green lights uh, green bits lighting up because, you know, I'm, I'm uh, talking of fascinating information. Uh, at least I find it fascinating. Um, the imagination network, as you might have guessed, is used for things like imagining future scenarios. Um, it's also remembering things that have happened in the past. It helps us construct mental images um, when we're engaged in, in uh, in activities. It also helps um, with social cognition. So when you uh, feel like you can understand how somebody else might feel or, or um, offer empathy, that's part of your brain that's um, uh, lighting up. And then there's this third area that they really um, looked at, which is known as the attentional flexibility network. And this is plays a really important role because what this does is it monitors uh, everything that's going on around you as well as inside your brain at any given time and kind of sometimes be as known as the salient network. And it, when it's um, 
monitoring, monitoring, monitoring these uh, external and internal events, it, it decides which is most um, important to your uh, stream of consciousness at the moment. So it flexibly kind of passes the baton uh, um, for whatever information is, is most relevant to solving the task at hand. So um, what they think after uh, doing a bunch of this research and um, Rex Young, is one of the researchers that headed this up. And he, um, he talks about what, what they think is happening is first off, they believe um, when we're thinking creatively, there is a reduction of the activation of the attentional control network. Um, and they call it incubation. So that laser focus is not something that we're doing at, at the time. And reducing this partially helps us allow inspiration in and new ideas to form. The second part of what's going on is there's an increase in the activation of the imagination, attentional and attentional flexible ne flexibility networks. So this might be why inspiration strikes you at the strangest of times um, when you least expect it. We've, we've done surveys before at Technion of, but where did you get your last great idea? It's never at the office. It's often in the shower, on the commute, while exercising, that sort of thing. And that's because that attentional control network has been um, deactivated or lessened to some extent. So great. Um, we know better now what's going on in our brains when we're thinking creatively. So how do we enable ourselves to do this more often? Well, uh, creativity in short, again, is not something mystical. It's an extension of things that you actually already know. But um, to be more specific, new behaviors or ideas emerge as old behaviors or ideas interact. Um, and really, in order for um, new behaviors to truly be new, um, the particular, like, um, or new ideas to come, I should say, it depends on previous things that we already have in our repertoire or our knowledge. We, um, we, 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 um, we grow on those, or we build on, on those, that prior knowledge. So uh, you can't write a French sonnet if you don't know French. It's kind of um, maybe a good example of, of how to say that. So we shouldn't expect ideas to kind of just show up without cultivating them or get frustrated if we aren't getting, uh, they don't miraculously come. It's, that would be like expecting to have uh, well-defined muscles without ever lifting any weights. We really do need to train um, ourselves to create them um, and to, to help ideas flourish or to be able to access them more quickly. So we're gonna talk about cultivating ideas. There are two basic principles um, about the production of ideas. The first being that one idea or, or a new idea uh, is nothing more or less than the combination, a new and novel combination of two existing old elements. So again, we're building on things we already know. And two, our capacity to bring old elements into new combination really depends largely on our ability to see relationships. And that's one of those skill building areas that we can work on to help us see relationships. Science has proposed three basic strategies by which all ideas evolve, and they are known as um, blending, breaking, and bending. And I'm just going to give them, give you a quick uh, description of each of those. So blending is when our brain combines two or more so sources in a novel way. And um, an, uh, an example of that would be uh, Scientist Randy Lewis understood that spider silk would, had a lot of commercial application. It's a very tensile strength uh, uh, fab fiber, but it's really hard to milk spiders or even uh, farm them to get them together. Um, so uh, he, he was having a lot of trouble. He'd been working on this problem for a while and he was at home, um, home on his family farm watching his mother milk a goat one day thinking, oh my gosh, I know what to do. He spliced the DNA of the spider with a goat 
And thus was born Feckles the spider goat. Now this is just for dramatic effect. Feckles looks just like a goat. But what happens is um, they sec she secretes, or the goats that they've uh, uh, added this DNA to, Feckles was the first, secretes the, um, the spider silk in, her, in their milk. And then once that they've uh, been milked, they extract the strands of spider silk in the lab and voila. Um, a very, uh, a large production um, opportunity for a very um, tensile uh, new fiber. So breaking um, is something where you take a solid or continuous thing and you fracture it into manageable pieces. This also gives you the opportunity to um, leave something out as well. So when uh, mobile phones, an example of this is when mobile phones first came out, the broadcasting signals worked just like TV and radio broadcasting had with a single tower broadcasting widely in all directions. But what they soon found out is that even though it doesn't matter how many people are watching TV at any given time for a signal, it certainly did when people were trying to make phone calls. And once more than you know a dozen calls were uh, using the tower, things would you'd get busy signals and it would drop. So instead, the engineers at Bell Labs took an innovative tact. They divided the single coverage area into small cells, each of which had its own tower. And that, if you ever wondered why it's called a cell phone, now you know, um, all those individual cells. The last strategy is uh, bending. So this is where we rework something that already exists. Bending uh, open up a wellspring of possibility, uh, possibilities through alterating alterations in sizes and shapes and material and more. So really um, changing something that already exists. And a, a really good example of this in our industry would be um, Frank Gehry, who uh, uses a lot of uh, computer modeling to really uh, bend and shape different planes of um, what has known been known as traditional architecture for quite some time. So I, I love the visuals for that. So I'm going to um, do a quick stop share because I'm going to show you a very quick clip of a, um, a movie a scene from Apollo 13. I'm guessing a lot of you have probably seen this movie before, but I want you to really listen carefully to the problem that's posed um, to these, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, I went into the wrong video. Um, what the engineers are having, the problem they're having to solve um, when the Apollo um, has run into an, an issue. So just give me two seconds here right now, make sure my computer sound is playing and here we go. We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We have a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs, handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this, using nothing but that. So let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. CO2 gas is literally poisoning the astronauts with every breath in and out. Okay, great. So I use that um, clip because it is a really a good example of all three of the strategies uh, that we have just um, discussed. So when the uh, engineers tore apart the equipment, they were breaking. When they taped together the cardboard plastic and sock and a hose to build an air filter, they were blending. And when they reversed the electric current aboard the Apollo 13 uh, to recharge the command module batteries, they were uh, bending. 
I would challenge you as you move through um, your days over the next couple of weeks to really look at things that you encounter in your life and think about where did they come from? Think about if they were something that existed before and it's just a, a change. I think like, um, you know, our, our modern smartphones, that used to be a computer and a phone. Those things were blended together to create a smartphone. So um, creating an idea or cultivating creativity uh, and uh, ideas is a process and one that we can practice and produce uh, to help us produce more um, ideas. Working out where to find the ideas is not the solution to finding more of them, but rather we need to train our brains uh, and our minds in the process of producing new ideas. So as I mentioned earlier, it does require both sides of our brains working together. So there are four distinct um, techniques uh, to help increase um, creative output. And each of them can be implemented in different situations in different ways and sometimes in multiple ways. And we're gonna look at those strategies um, for yourself to see if you can't um, delve into these a little bit further. The first one is capturing. And one of the things that distinguishes uh, creative people from the rest of us can often be um, the creative ones have learned ways to pay attention um, and then preserve some of the new ideas that occur. They're not, um, they're not quashing those fleeting thoughts as they come by. Actually, Einstein, I believe it was Einstein, was notorious for taking naps in the afternoon and he'd have a pen in one hand and um, a notepad on his chest and as he, or a ball, sorry, in his hand and a pen and a uh, pad on his chest and as the, he would fall asleep, he'd hang his hand over the side of the, the bed and the ball would drop, it would wake him and he would write down whatever stream of consciousness was going on in his brain at the time. So we do, um, we call capturing uh, the most fertile ground for capturing. I have the bed, the bath and the bus. Again, this is one of those, those are places where we're maybe relaxed. Um, the attentional um, uh, control network is uh, lessened to some a point and we're allowing inspiration to come through. But keep a notebook handy, use the voice um, uh, record on your phone or even the notebook section. And as things fleet, come fleeting by, just jot them down. You don't have to do anything with them at the moment. Just give them, uh, give them some air to breathe and a little bit of life by acknowledging those uh, thoughts. Challenging is a, another way to accelerate the flow of new ideas by challenging yourself or putting yourself um, in a difficult situation where you're most likely to fail to some extent. None of us, if that, that's a messy stuff, we don't like to push ourselves that way because it's not comfortable. But again, it's in those times of frustration and, and discomfort that we do um, come up with some really great ideas. I think right now, this time in history is a really good example of this where faster than ever before in history, we have had a group of people coming together to solve a seemingly unsolvable problem uh, like a global uh, pandemic and creating a vaccine in a shorter amount of time because it is, uh, it was, we had no other option. So kind of the idea here is that, you know, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. Right? but challenging yourself and challenge your, yourself uh, to things that um, make you think differently. Broadening is also a deceptively, uh, here's a deceptively simple fact is that for repertoires or behaviors to contribute to the genera generative process, they must first ex exist. Remember I said you can't write a French sonnet if you don't write French. This is where um, you know, foundational information is so very important, learning things um, that allow us to build upon. And the traditional education system does this well. It gives us information and knowledge where sometimes it falls short is actually um, helping individuals to uh, go beyond the, the traditional thoughts or um, going outside of the lines and trying things that are different. But you know, take courses, take, take a course in something that you wouldn't normally take a course in or listen to podcasts um, or uh, discover new information. Wikipedia has a, do you feel lucky uh, button or a um, random generator button, I should say, you know, go on there sometime and learn something um, that you didn't go out uh, searching for specifically or that the algorithm didn't send your way. The last uh, technique is something that's really great in our industry and it's called surrounding. And uh, surrounding is the principle of um, the fact that when we uh, 
you can enhance your creativity by surrounding yourself with diverse stimuli and even more important, changing that stimuli regularly. Um, diverse and changing stimuli and, uh, promote creativity because they get multiple behaviors kind of competing with each other. So um, this is great activity-based uh, environments that um, have you moving your location or changing uh, your space. So, um, so far we've discussed a little bit about why we get stuck in the same patterns of thinking. That's the hike because our brains are, are um, you know, we're, we're wired that way to cry, find those paths of least resistance. We know what's happening in our brains when we're being creative. We know what parts of our brain um, are lighting up. We've looked at strategies by which um, new ideas come about. So blending, breaking and bending. Uh, I think you'll be more attuned to seeing those in action in your world uh, now. And we've talked about ways that we can cultivate our own cre creativity. So the challenging, um, the, the uh, stimulation, uh, broadening and um, uh, capturing. So all of those things that really, if we look to focus on those and look at ways that we can um, develop those skills, we should find ourselves more prepared to um, come up with uh, creative solutions as we move forward. And this is kind of, this is where, this quote is actually kind of where Lick the Frog uh, came from for me. It was a, a conversation that I'd had with um, a, a, a colleague um, in another industry. Her name is Tamara Eberly, and she uh, is with an organization called Traction Strategy. Tracy has, has met with her before. Um, and we were talking about creative thinking and how do you really push yourself? And uh, she shared with me a set of tools uh, called Sneakerfish Classic Provocation uh, Cards. And this is a way to, a structured way to uh, provoke our brains into trying to think of things differently. And it's only when our brain is confronted with stimuli that it has not encountered before does it start to recognize perception and start to make those connections. So um, if what we do again is just still think of about a problem the same way we've always thought about a problem, we are missing the opportunity to push ourselves into new and different um, boundaries or push our own boundaries. So these, um, these cards are a great a way to um, find a challenge, think of your challenge, and then use a provocation, um, a creative thinking provocation like uh, these cards or any other, um, the web, the, the internet is full of all kinds of different um, uh, kind of creative thinking techniques that you can use as a bouncing off point uh, for something. But here's an example of one of, um, I'm going to use an example of one of these uh, cards. So, you know, if you think of a problem, whether it's macro or micro, um, I mean, you could think of how do you solve world peace or, um, you know, what color should I paint my front door? You can take a moment and um, think of what your challenge is, pull a card. And I pulled one of these cards and it's um, based on the theme of taking care of business. And it, the, the card says, what are the systems, processes and technology used in the business below? Experiment with applying these to your opportunity or challenge. And the word below is bank. And so um, these cards all have sort of a different theme um, that uh, made to measure, and this talks about sizing, mashup brings two different kind of uh, ideas together, professional help is like, what would a fireman do? Uh, taking care of business again is different um, uh, businesses or different or, uh, industries than the one you're in. And you start thinking about that. You don't necessarily think about your problem at the beginning, but you start thinking about different ways. Um, and then you start throwing ideas out not the idea or the answer, but all kinds of ideas. So I don't know if any of you have ever done any kind of improv or you've gone to an improv where you have to say yes and, you can never say yes but. It's very much the same way is that you have to, whether you're doing it in a group or you're doing it uh, just by yourself, you have to uh, push yourself to um, the possibilities of different um, solutions or like spaghetti on a wall. You throw all these ideas out and then you start to pick through them. And I'm getting 
to give you, um, I just stopped sharing quickly, just on the time here. I just want to give you um, a little technique that you can maybe do yourself. And it, this window keeps sitting in front of my, whoops, in front of my share screen. Ask it to generate two to eight words, many of them. Um, it, there's tons of them on the, on the internet. And it will give you a list of three words or four words or however many you put in. And then just take five minutes when you're brushing your teeth maybe and actually try and find a connection between these three seemingly random words. So like uh, you might get jukebox and hairbrush and um, pillows. And you just sit there and you try and think, what are the things that bring jukebox, hairbrush and pillows all together? Um, I don't know, because I just thought of those three words, but this is where, this is that frustrating and messy and I, I, I'm having to push myself to find a way to um, think of, of connections with those three words. Um, but that's what, that's kind of, that's one of those exercises you can easily do to help you uh, push yourself there. I'm gonna give you an example of where um, these cards uh, or provocations were used in a real life example. So there was a group of mall employees going through um, a workshop and they were being asked, they were given a, a pile of different um, problems or uh, issues that were occurring within their organization. And they were asked to look at ways to create um, ideas or generate ideas, not solve the problem, just generate all kinds of different ideas about them. And one of the issues was when there's a slip, when there's a, a liquid spill in the mall, um, the chances of having an insurance claim against them or having an accident go up um, much higher the longer it takes to get a wet um, sign out, one of those uh, yellow um, tent cards out that says slippery. And typically somebody would spot the spill, call maintenance, maintenance would go to a hallway, get the sign out and then put it down uh, where it needed to be. That's a long process. And so this was a, an issue that these, these guys were looking at. They pulled a card and it would, it's, the card said cactus. It was just a provocation word. And what does that have to do with your problem? And so they started thinking about cactuses. Cactuses are prickly, you need to water them. They go in pots. And somebody said, oh, well, we have a lot of pots in the mall. Oh, well, okay, well, they're big pots. Could we put the sign in the pot? And that was just all they said, and they set it aside. It was somebody else's job to come along afterwards and take all those ideas and look and see if there was a way to flush them out. And what they pulled was that one. And they said, well, actually, that pots doesn't work because there's earth and it's that they're open, they're accessible, the signs would go missing. But we also do have all these um, garbage receptacles and recycling receptacles along the mall that have open doors that aren't locked. And so any mall employee going past that saw what a sign or a slip or a wet, uh, a wet spill could go to one of those receptacles, open the door, grab a slippery one wet, put it there and then call maintenance to come and clean it up. So reducing the time of the spill and the opportunity for accident by a large amount. So just simply by looking at a problem and saying, a uh, cactus, a, a word that had nothing to do with their problem, but really just kind of growing or uh, pushing on that. So um, Lick the Frog, it, it is no, uh, um, it is a means to an end. It's not the end. It's about stretching your creative muscle or moving outside of your uh, comfort zone, right? As I said before, research shows that everybody is, uh, has creative abilities and that's great news. Our problems today are not getting simpler. Um, with creativity, we have to stop relying on what's always been and open our eyes to what might be. And as problems get more complex, there are fewer examples of how to solve them. We like think of the past year, we had to learn how to do things in a very different way. So my uh, call to action to you would be to um, help um, boost your creative output to capture your new ideas as they come, as they occur. Don't dismiss them quite so rapidly and just, just uh, jot things down and you may come back to it later. Challenge yourself uh, in order to get your ideas competing. Push yourself, um, maybe even as a family or a group of friends, try to solve an impossible problem. Broaden your training so that you have many new repertoires or behaviors to, to draw from or pull from. You never know where you might uh, from a, a just the odd location that you might get inspiration from and surround yourself with as much stimuli as possible uh, to help get uh, get your juices flowing. 
I will say with 100% certainty that it is always easier to tame down a crazy idea than it is to ever innovate or um, try and uh, um, enhance or, or boost up an old and tired one. So um, really make, having crazy ideas or uh, mastering some of these creative strategies is, is uh, all it may take to kind of push you in the right direction to start thinking about things differently. So um, that is uh, my time. I went a little uh, a little on a side tangent there, um, but uh, any questions about um, sort of what the, the information that I shared today? It was a, a labor of love pulling all that research together for me and it certainly did um, push myself to think about things uh, differently. Can you just sure. recap it's breaking blending and bending bending yeah blending so blending and bending yeah so okay. blending bringing together two things that exist already and just in a completely different way or way nobody's done it before mm -hmm. um uh breaking is definitely uh cracking things apart you can take things out so something that might have so an example would have been um windshield car windshields when when uh, cars were first invented you couldn't drive at night because the there was so much glare that would bounce off the uh the windshield from um uh the headlights coming towards you and there was a crystal that it was known to to dull the glare um satellite crystals i think but they were so big the windshields would have had to have been like uh you know uh, almost a foot thick to do that and it wasn't possible <laughs> But um, one very bright guy said, well, why can't I break that crystal down into an almost minuscule non, you can't even see it and then distribute it within the glass, what would happen then? And that's exactly, that's the same technology we still use today. And that was like way back. Um, uh, and it was just a matter of making it smaller, changing the size. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. This was really, yeah. really engaging and interesting. Thank you. I, I again, I, I think you, you kind of start to look at things a little bit differently when you're standing there and you're looking at a, an invention or something that exists in your world and go, how did that happen? Why do we have that? Well, yeah. it was something that already existed. Yeah. Laura Lee, um, fantastic presentation. Great timing to have this at the beginning of the year coming off of holidays when I got to wake up, <clears throat> get myself start thinking again. Uh, I know some people, you mentioned something about a, a card game uh, and someone actually gave a recommendation to it. Yes. Okay, so the name of it. What's the one that you were yeah, talking about? I just posted it in chat website. Thank you so much. Okay. So it, and actually it was a conversation with Tamara um, Eberly at Traction Strategy that kind of uh, and, a, and a, a task that I had been um, asked to uh, do a five minute engagement with some of my colleagues uh, on a subject that I was interested in create made me go down this path of uh, developing the CEU because somebody said, oh, that's really interesting. You should do more of that. <laughs> so, so, uh, it was no. a lot. But these cards are great. Um, but again, even applying um, like the Wikipedia random word uh, or random uh, information and saying, okay, well, what would that industry or that subject matter or, you know, um, some people, some people have. Uh, oh my God! I just watched Glee over the Christmas. Don't don't even know why I admitted that because I needed something that was happy and not uh, engaging. But they had an episode where it was, uh, you know, uh, what would um, Stevie Wonder do or something, and it was. And that that's one of the things you could say. Um, what would this? What would a different industry do if they were faced with this problem? What would a different Per, what would what would Nelson Mandela do? Um, and then think about all of those things, and then and then look at applying it to your problem. Um, and again, there are no right answers at the beginning. It's we so often stop ourselves from um, throwing out as many ideas as possible. There's a really good example of an exercise: uh, a thousand uses for a paperclip. Has anybody ever done that one? It's a like a really good icebreaker. I think that. Uh, people use sometimes where they say, okay, what are, what are a thousand uses for a paperclip? And the first five, you hold paper, you um, pick a lock, you make a necklace. But by the time you're getting into the sixth, 12th, 18th thing, it is incredibly creative and crazy ideas that, um, that people come up with because you're pushing yourself to go beyond, you know, stopping. And we learn to stop really fast.
because we're wired that way. It's, it, it, it's our brains telling us we already know the answer. Mm. Right. Great. Okay, Laurel, I just got one other question here that came in. Um, what have you seen or what can we add to our physical environment? What do you see just missing typically from our physical environment to sort of promote or provoke creative thinking? Oh, fantastic. Uh, changing and, and differing stimuli. And I hope Mark, um, I'm sure Mark will build on this. I love him, by the way. I've heard him speak and, and um, uh, we'll probably maybe try and eavesdrop on his next presentation, Mark Ainley. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, nature, symbols of nature in a space that actually do um, not only uh, give us a physiological uh, impact, but also can trigger uh, concepts or ideas. Um, biomimicry is such an important um, study of trying to look at how mother nature has solved problems before and uh, how we can apply those to real our, our current problems. Um, actually, Traction Strategy has a set of cards called Inspired by Nature. So you can actually look at, um, especially in design, looking at patterns in nature that you can um, uh, use, but also um, so complex patterns, color, but even just moving yourself within a space and not staying stagnant within the same uh, location all the time. Um, we, again, that well-worn hiking path, when we are so familiar with everything that surrounds us, we don't see it anymore. So we can't, it, looking at it, it's really hard to see something differently that you see all the time, but it's much easier to go and look at different things to get inspiration. And that's one of those, um, that's one of those principles of surrounding why they talk about changing, uh, whether it's even art. So here's a great um, kind of thing for clients is to have them on an art rotation program. So there are plenty of, of organizations that you will do uh, change out, monthly change out, even uh, greenery companies that will do plant change uh, as well for the seasons. Um, yeah, looking at small little things uh, that you can change frequently within a space that don't have uh, large uh, cost change. I, I put a screensaver on my, a random screensaver on my TV a lot um, because, because it changes and I don't know what it is. Some days it might be changing forest scenes, cityscapes, um, uh, fish, cats, because my dog goes crazy when I put the cats up. Uh, but even so much as that. On that change. note, um, not the, I have no affiliation with this website or app, but I will say that uh, for those of you who don't know about artfinder.com, it is an okay. incredible website. It, it's a network of artists from around the world, and they just this is how they sell their art. And the quality and the, the diversity of the art you can purchase and the, the pricing is very reasonable. Um, came across it, bought two pieces, of small two small pieces of art myself, and it's a, this has kind of made me think about that of I'm just trying to wake up my office a bit for the new year, change it out a little bit. And uh, even like, we are, we are such creatures of habit. Yeah. Like even going, uh, I have a local pub that I love to go to and I go to that pub, but nothing ever changes in that pub. <laughs> you know, go somewhere else, experience something different. Not that, you know, when we can. Right now we're all looking at a lot of the exact same stuff and the exact same people, an awful lot. So you know, go for a drive, go for a walk, drive to a different neighborhood and walk there, you know. And of course, on that note, um, we are trying to bring new and exciting topics to our future webinars. We'll be sending out some, a feedback form. If there's any topics you'd like us to, to research and find speakers on, please, please, please feel free to give the feedback when, um, when the email comes out to you after this presentation. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. Thank you everybody for coming. All the events are posted on our website, chaseoffice.ca under the events section. And Laura Lee, I, I think it's, it goes without saying that we will be looking forward to have you back again on this topic again, or even uh, version two of it as it comes out. Thank you so much. Absolutely happy to. Yeah, Thanks. Good to see all of you. Thanks, Laura Lee. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.